Great. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the panel on international governance and cooperation. Over the last, is it only a day? It feels like a really, it feels like a week. <laughs> Over the last week, um, we've had a, a lot of conversations about uh, what's missing. You know, an interesting conversation yesterday about the Paris Agreement focusing on emissions agreements and targets, but not fossil fuel supply. This morning around what MDBs are using, uh, doing on a just transition, but again, not necessarily a commitment to stop ramping down supply. Really, this panel is kind of digging into the question of what are the new uh, mechanisms and conversations that we need to have and cooperation between countries in order to manage who gets to produce and how much and for how long? How do we ensure that fossil fuel supply and production is managed in a way that is equitable and fair? And what are the new agreements or mechanisms that are going to be necessary in the international space in order to, in order to define that? Uh, to, uh, transition and to manage that. So without further ado, each of our panelists are going to uh, uh, speak for 10 minutes, then we'll have some time for questions. I'll introduce them one by one. Our first panelist is Natalie Jones, uh, who uh, was a research associate at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. I just wanted to say that, the study of existential <laughs> risk at Cambridge University um, and, and uh, is now uh, with ISD, uh, a policy advisor in their sustainable energy supply team. Natalie, over to you. Well, it's great to be here and thank you so much um, for the introduction. Um, so, you know, like we all heard it was um, Rosh Hashanah yesterday. So, you know, you know, like in the spirit of the new year, in the spirit of um, making a new year's resolution, I would like to just propose in this presentation some potential resolutions that countries might like to make, maybe, um, but those will come at the end. So we have a, a, some kind of explanation before we get to these New Year's resolutions. Um, so this is really presenting a, a study that we did about fossil fuel production, how countries are discussing fossil fuel production in their um, national communications under the Paris Agreement. So nationally determined contributions, NDCs, and long-term low emissions development strategies. Um, and, you know, you might ask, you know, why look at these things? Um, the Paris Agreement doesn't even mention fossil fuels. You know, why would we think that these are remotely interesting? Um, we were working um, off the basis of a, a, a a study done in 2018 that looked at the Paris Agreement's architecture and identified ways that countries, if they wanted to, uh, could start to address um, supply-side policies within the Paris Agreement's architecture. So, like, not to say that the Paris Agreement was designed for this, but like little hooks that countries could use if they want, and you know, you know, r really conditional. Um, two of these, um, the first one is NDCs. I'm guessing everyone knows what these are. Um, LEDs, um, long-term low emissions development strategies, um, maybe not everyone knows these, so I'll just briefly outline, they are voluntary, so countries don't have to submit them, but they can. Um, they are longer term in time horizon than NDCs, they typically look out to mid-century, um, and they, they tend to be a bit more, um, like, less focused on specific targets or commitments, although they can include these, but a bit more, you know, longer documents with scenarios, road mapping, pathways, all these kinds of things. So these are both sort of key international documents for countries to plan and communicate the energy transition. So, you know, hypothetically, hypothetically, countries can use NDCs and LEDs to communicate plans and policies for a just and equitable transition away from fossil fuel production. Um, these could be existing ones. Um, uh, and, you know, this could help to normalise the transition um, and foster international cooperation. So it could be complementary, potentially, to initiatives which we're going to hear about uh, later on the panel, the um, registry and the treaty in BOGA, which we heard about yesterday. But, you know, complementary, like I would not say this is the most important thing, um, but I think it could be one important facet. Um, and because we've had two rounds of NDCs, we had a first kind of 
round that countries communicated in 2015, 2016, and then we had another round uh, from 20 sort of 2020, 2021. Um, it's a good time to take stock. So have countries taken this opportunity? Um, what else are they saying about fossil fuel production in their NDCs? It's just, it's just a good time to have a look at it. So uh, what we did, uh, we read all of the NDCs and LEDs submitted by fossil fuel producing countries only, um, up till and including COP26. We actually, um, like, we started off doing a keyword search and then I found that like it, w it wasn't picking up quite everything. So then I just went back and like read all of them. Um, so that was 103, <laughs> yeah. It turns out that artificial intelligence, slightly helpful, not, not entirely. So um, that was 103 first round NDCs, 81 second round NDCs, and that discrepancy in number is because some countries, some fossil fuel producing countries by the time of COP26 had not submitted their NDC yet, but we thought it was a good cutoff date because like, you know, like that was the date where they were meant to do it. Um, and then 31 uh, LEDs. So again, it's a smaller number because they were voluntary, um, but it's still quite a big number. Like a lot, of, you know, qu quite a few of these countries did actually submit LEDs, which is qu quite interesting. Um, we extracted all the text relating to fossil fuel production that's actually in a database, which we'll talk about later. Um, but we did not include any text relating to consumption. So nothing about coal-fired power plants, nothing about... Um, gas, turbines, whatever. Um, and if it was ambiguous, we didn't include it. So if it was just like coal, then it didn't go into this. Um, and then we coded the data according to uh, categories that emerged as we were reading. Um, so I will share some of the kind of top line findings, but I, you know, like there's a lot more in our papers. So I would uh, also encourage you to look for, you know, the full thing. Um, but this is the sort of, this is the kind of uh, uh, main finding that is very general. Okay, so what we found is that an increasing majority of NDCs from fossil fuel producing countries mention fossil fuel production in some way, not necessarily in a supply side policy kind of way, which I will come to later, um, but in some way. So the middle bar here is the first round of NDCs from 2015, and you will see that slightly under half of them uh, countries mentioned fossil fuel production in some way. Um, by the time we get to the second round, so five years later, actually of the documents we analysed, a clear majority, about two thirds, have mentioned fossil fuel production, and it's you know an absolute increase over the first round. So even if we assume that like all of those ones there that we didn't analyze because they weren't yet um, communicated, uh, it's still a majority. Um, so, and then the LEDs, I mean, you know, nearly three quarters of them mentioned fossil fuel production, which is quite interesting. And we think this might be because LEDs, um, again, can be this more kind of speculative, like what, what if we do this? What if we do that? Let's look at these different scenarios so they can, so it's maybe more of a safer space, potentially. Um, but again, this is, you know, in some way, and this was a surprising result to me because I thought the Paris Agreement doesn't mention fossil fuels, there's not gonna be a lot here, but there actually is a lot. Now let's, let's break it down. Um, this is where it gets interesting. So if we think about, you know, this sort of classic, well not, cla but you know, the kind of, uh, fossil fuel production reduction, phase out, phase down sort of policies we might think about. Um, this is how many NDCs and LEDs talk about those. Um, so it's a very small minority. Uh, it's not a lot. Um, so countries are not on the whole using this opportunity well, um, but a few are and it has been increasing. So in the first round of NDCs, there were two countries um, in the second round of NDCs, there were five countries, and those were countries that we already knew about having these policies. But it's it's like so like not not even all fossil fuel producing countries that have made supply side commitments. Not all of them have communicated them internationally. So there might be some kind of disconnect here. Like our countries thinking, oh, you know, this topic isn't relevant to NDCs because NDCs are about emissions reduction. So maybe there's more communication that needs to be done there, or maybe, yeah, I mean, there could be many things going on there. Um, but in LEDs, I mean, again, the proportion is a lot higher. It's um, nearly half of LEDs do, do have some kind of production wind down, either not necessarily commitments, again, 
although often they are commitments, um, such as in the case of Denmark, France, but also projections, so mapping out, you know, what different scenarios would look like. Um, I've just put some examples on the slide, FYI, if you're, if, if you're interested. So on the other hand, okay, um, so if we look at um, a, a key finding of ours was that many countries explicitly in their NDCs and or LEDs state an intention to continue or increase production. Um, you, you can see it's a lot more. Um, than on the previous slide. Um, I've picked out some examples not to like name, and sh well, not necessarily in, in terms of naming and shaming, but because they're quite representative of what we see. For example, Argentina and its NDC, it literally says it's going to increase its production of natural gas as a tr transition fuel. Um, and yeah, not to name or shame Argentina, but it's, it's representative. Um, we included, so, this category has like some uh, subcategories as well, but we included in this one um, countries that that included some kind of mitigation or adaptation measures, such as like a net zero commitment for the oil and gas industry, while not also having um, production phase up because we were concerned about, you know, the potential for net zero commitments to basically, um, what's the term, basically be a greenwash for, for, for not doing supply side policies. But this is disaggregated as well in the analysis. Um, we, you know, just for richness, we uh, also found a lot of mentions of kind of equity things, economic diversification, just transition. Um, I would look at the full paper for these. And, you know, this is the kind of uh, resolution part. Countries, you know, could improve um, <laughs> in this regard um, if NDCs and LEDs will um, uh, reach their potential to help to normalise this policy um, in the international community. And we identify um, a number of different areas um, in which uh, countries could include more information and or targets, policies, et cetera, um, in their NDCs. Um, for the full thing, um, we have a working paper from 2019, uh, one from last year. We have a data set that's publicly available and a peer-reviewed article uh, under revision, hopefully accepted soon. <laughs> and thanks so much. Looking forward to your questions. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Natalie. And, and that, um, right near the end there, you recommended um, more information on reserves and production, which is the greatest segue to Johnny West from Carbon Tracker. Um, Johnny is a social entrepreneur and public policy analyst of natural resources. He's the lead technical advisor in the build out of the Global Registry of Fossil Fuels that was just released last week uh, at Climate Week in New York. Johnny, over to you. Thank you. Um, morning, everyone. So, as Sephora mentioned, the Global Registry uh, um, was launched last week um, <laughs> after considerable effort. And it, it's uh, really a very um, simple idea, which, in fact, the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, incubated, uh, which is that we need a trusted public domain source uh, of emissions as granular as possible uh, on the supply side. Uh, I mean, the, the, the base of it, we can go through all kinds of screens, but the base of it is really this very simple idea, trusted public domain. And I should actually, I will just preface everything by saying, uh, although Carbon Tracker with its partners at Global Energy Monitor and so on, we've developed it, um, we, because we see this as being a necessary standing part of the infrastructure, uh, our real end game is to get it transferred into um, an institution of you know international political legitimacy and there are kind of early stage conversations open with various people in and around UN organizations the idea is to build this tool so that it becomes embedded in multi-party negotiations of all kinds um, probably don't need to dwell on this with this crowd um, the mismatch um, between um, what's embedded in reserves against uh, current budgets. Um, um, transparency, funnily enough, I'm finding is something that um, ev even uh, amongst um, climate activists and um, uh, uh, academics may need a little bit more um, expanding. Um, um, we can't get to, to lots of decision making um, at a granular level without having uh, something that's in 
public domain and very open. So all of the um, data on the website is downloadable. There's an emissions uh, model, an emissions factor uh, model, which is also downloadable. Um, um, the idea is that, that we're in a virtuous circle of critique and improvement, and that's actually already happened since um, in the last week since publication. We had someone coming in um, with some strong and valid objections to the way we were factoring net zero um, with Australian gas. We, we're reworking, and um, it looks as though those numbers will be better, and they'll simply go in and replace. And we also had uh, a regulator contribute um, data. And I, I actually said, is, is all this public domain? And he said, well, um, it's what I'm mandated to give anyone who asked, so I'm simply saying you asked, which is an interesting dynamic. Um, so everything in the, um, um, in the database and the set of associated um, um, models is um, coming out of a, a very scrappy range of sources. Um, we do have a bunch of regulators who do issue, um, I mean, there's an incredible variation. You know, in British Columbia, you can actually get the geolocation and monthly production of every single gas well right across the province. You could actually create a mobile app which you could access in your car and drive past and understand that that well produced um, you know, 300,000 cubic meters of gas last year at one end of the spectrum. And meanwhile, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, Russia, OPEC, uh, China, um, and unfortunately, of course, those are all areas of massive uh, fossil fuel production. So we've got models feeding in, we've got structured data from um, where we can get it. Um, we've got also to cover all of the information dark area, which is, you know, three quarters of global fossil fuels or more, our partners at Global Energy Monitor have painstakingly um, um, kind of human researched, if I can put it like that. Uh, um, first of all, the coal mine tracker. The information on coal is actually better than the information on oil and gas, which was a real revelation to me, thanks to GEM's material. So it's all in there and then crunched down and uh, normalized. and does as much grisly detail as you have the appetite for in the documentation. Every single source has a raw data file, a processed data file, and a description of how we went from one to the other. Because the goal of the registry is to be able to offer end numbers which are not fossil fuel production, because in fact, a fossil fuel production is, is the proxy, emissions is the goal, um, CO, so CO2E, um, uh, uh, everything is, is standardized as much as possible. And there's a delicate balancing act there between, you know, when you normalize, when you don't, um, what health warnings you put on the data. You know, you've got a lot of big fields that might have data that's two years old or three years old, but then it's flagged that this is a 2019 data point or whatever. Uh, but, but all of that so that we can produce as many instances as possible of a CO2E number associated with an individual field or, or coal mine. So that's the front interface, you can go in. There's um, summary at country level, um, possibly, oh, here's the link, yes. A couple of things just worth noting here. Um, you can flip between methane quotients, that may be slightly nerdy, but it has a massive, massive impact on the overall estimate of, of CO2E. Uh, one of the big, revelations for me um, in this is that um, if you fact, I don't know how um, widespread this knowledge of the methane factoring issue is, but there's at least two different factors depending on what period of time you consider the methane to be uh, uh, working under. And all reporting has hitherto been on the lower basis, so-called GWP 100. Um, attention is now turning to the higher basis. So all of this sounds very dry and arcane. The difference is five gigatons a year. You know, you, you, can, you can think that fossil fuels are emitting 40 gigatons, 40 billion tons of CO2e a year. Well, yes, if you use the GWP 100 factor, actually it's 45 billion tons a year if you use a different factor. That's not even new data, that's just an interpretation question. So. Um, where there's more than one source, you can access the source and see that. And 
variations um, because the underlying data sources, most of them actually come with a confidence range. So you've got midpoints, but variations. For many purposes, you want a midpoint, but for others, you want to actually expose the uncertainty and everything is, is downloadable, right? So, um, and then carrying forward with a series of projections, and this is where um, we would regard the registry as having a kind of editing function. So who has a scenario that's worth replicating out? Um, what quality do we assign to it? Um, um, these, lines, oh, these lines here um, take you forward into the future from historic data, and these shapes here underneath are reserves. And what you can see here, which happens in many cases, one of the reasons I think that reserves are overrated as a metric to, to judge what's going on, is that there's already a production path here, which has come from a national regulator, which goes way beyond the current stated reserves. The current stated reserves run out here, but this is the production pattern from the regulator going through to 2040, right? So there's a dynamic replacement in and around reserves, which everyone is assuming Will, will go on. The same um, at an individual field level. These then are giving you um, CO2E estimates, uh, supply chain, combustion total with margins of error for a single coal mine. Again, you can flip the uh, methane quotient, quotient. And it starts to get powerful when you are at the field level. These are the top 10 fields of Norway, expressed again in terms of CO2E, oil and gas combined. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and so you can begin to see what's going to happen in the future there. And if you're looking to produce, suppose from our side, we want to say, Norway, how do you cut a billion tons? How do you do that? You, you actually have to come in to what the historic production is and then project out some future production and then play with those numbers. But it should be working from, from, the emission, from an emission-centric point of view. We should be able to model how Norway, two or three different scenarios that Norway cuts a billion tons, um, direct in CO2E terms. Um, this is, um, I think, the reason we put it in, this is not yet in the database, but um, we're going to do this in the coming weeks. The US Inflation Reduction Act has imposed a tax for political purposes, they call it a fee, but it's a tax on methane. Um, the prospective value of liability there is, is about $15 billion. There's all kinds of exceptions carved in, so it may only end up being $5 billion. But that's $5 billion that companies are going to be figuring out how to pay in the next few months. We have about 30,000 US assets. So, um, so we can put the methane liability on 30,000 separate um, fields in the US within the next few weeks. And we have ownership details for about um, uh, um, 5,000 of them. Um, lastly, um, these is, um, the registry is designed to work in, um, in um, combination with other data sets. These are the ones we've done to date. So with EITI, we've taken their tax data and then simply worked the numbers to find tax take per ton of CO2e, which could be a metric used in a just uh, transition debate. Um, for an investment firm, we've started to take uh, the methane emissions and figure out an implied methane emissions rate, which they that are then using to engage in their portfolio. And at that kind of geeky end of the spectrum, there is actually a, a model, the model with the emissions factors in it, um, sitting there in the database, which allows you, as I say, to, to go in and do your own modeling out of managed decline scenarios directly. So the end purpose is to create a community. So I would simply close out by saying, um, we, we simply, see the role of the registry as being a kind of part of the furniture, essentially bean counting. I mean, it's a humble, and there's a lot of drudgery in this task as well, but it's a humble task of bean counting on the supply side. Um, and there are some details there in the way that the emissions factors are put together, which are different for supply side than they would be for demand side. And just growing it in um, collaboration with you and the extended community in terms of both data sets and ongoing interpretation questions. Thank you.
A really incredible piece of work, and I can see many, many questions on people's faces, so I'm just going to keep um, uh, moving forward and, and to the rest of the presentations and not um, take up time uh, in between, um, though I will say that many of you have done incredible research using data on fossil fuel production, and pretty much all of the pieces uh, of research that I've seen over the last five years have had to buy the data from Rystad. So as of last week, you don't have to buy the data from Rystad, which I think is actually a really critical point. We've all spent hundreds of thousands of dollars buying the data in order to be able to talk about production. So I think it's a real, a real service. Okay, um, Peter. Peter Newell is a professor of international relations at the University of Sussex and the co-founder and research director of the Rapid Transition Alliance. Um, he is also, I would say, the co-founder, with me and others, of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative and sits on the Global Steering Committee uh, of the Fossil Fuel Treaty. Peter, over to you. Thanks very much, Sip. Um, so I'd like to talk through some possible elements of a treaty, and this is in a paper that I've been working on with Haro Van Asselt that I know has attended this conference many times in the past and is known to many of you here. And it's really picking up on some of the conversations we've had over the last day or so about people accepting the clear and obvious needs to keep fossil fuels in the ground and to do so fairly and increasingly through a multilateral process. But increasingly, I think all of us face these questions about, well, so what would it look like? What would be the actual contents and possible elements of a treaty? And so what we're trying to do in this, in this paper is, is think, think through that uh, question. So we think about potential institutional mechanisms, principles, procedures, and other elements, partly drawing on uh, parallels and precedents from other treaties, and Rebecca will probably talk about that uh, in a moment. Um, but trying to you know, source ideas from academic and grey literature about some of these key dimensions. So let me just briefly run through what some of those dimensions are. Firstly, we have a, we, we're thinking through what would be the scope, which fossil fuels would be included and excluded. For us, it has to be uh, coal, oil and gas. I know some people, Anthony Burke and co, talk about the need for a coal elimination treaty, and they think that should be the primary focus. We think we need a discussion that links uh, across all fossil fuels and that all need to be included. Um, given the scale of the problem and, of course, the uneven endowments that we have across, across the world. In terms of objectives, for us, it clearly has to be about doing what Paris doesn't do. In other words, it has to be aligning fossil fuel production with the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. And this would obviously mean limiting further production of fossil fuels that's consistent with those sorts of goals. So setting a clear burnable carbon budget with baselines and parameters. And these, of course, would be revised in light of scientific assessments, inputs from the global registry, perhaps, uh, et cetera, as well as taking on board equity considerations. In terms of core principles, um, there are a number that we think would be written into a treaty. Um, Obviously, we'd have to have an element of historical responsibility for all the reasons that we've talked about at this conference, and this clearly runs through the notion of common but differentiated responsibility in the um, climate regime. And the other key component of that, of course, is respective capabilities, and that's an important part for, for us, as we heard on the panel earlier on, on just transitions. Countries are differently placed in terms of their ability to transition away from fossil fuels, and that has to be explicitly recognised um, and supported. A second key principle would probably be polluter pays or extractor pays principle. Um, clearly, precedents for polluter pays in many bodies of international environmental law, that would be an important part of, of a fossil fuel treaty. And thirdly, just transition. And of course, we've got the language of just transition in the preamble of the, of the Paris Agreement, and that would be an important principle to um, to mention. And as we saw in the panel again this morning, um, you could take precedents and principles from human rights instruments around procedural or, or distributional and also, of course, intergenerational justice um, that would that could be written in. And then finally, in terms of principles, it'd be important for us to have a non-regression clause um, so that you lock in upwards progression. And, and some of those sorts of clauses feature uh, in human rights instruments. Um, and that's the sort of thing we would want to see to make sure there wouldn't be backtracking of any sort. So that's principles. In terms of commitments, we were imagining a series of sort of substantive and procedural commitments. Um, clearly, goals and time frames would need to, to be guided by ongoing expert input and scientific assessment in terms of percentages that need to remain in the ground. Um, and criteria for allocating and sequencing commitments 
would include things like um, the cost of action being disproportionately borne by those with the greatest ability to pay. So basic sort of equity principle. The greatest producers should act first. So that's the historical responsibility element. Um, and the cumulative emissions are assessed to, to account for that historical responsibility. But you also might layer upon that a series of financial obligations around phase out of public support, public financial support in the forms of subsidies, tax breaks, aid, export credit finance, all those sorts of things, both domestically and internationally. Again, picking up on themes from this morning. Um, as well as procedural commitments, which might be around um, obligations for reporting, monitoring, compliance, etc. So those of you that are familiar with the treaty campaign and some of the ideas behind it will know people often talk about the three, the three pillars. Um, the first one, of course, is it ending expansion. Um, and there's precedence for control. Rebecca may talk about these in more detail from things like the Tobacco Control Treaty, the Montreal Protocol, the Ottawa Treaty on, on landmines, or of course the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty itself. So we could have quantifiable targets, the percentages of fossil fuels that might need to stay in the ground, et cetera. So ending expansion would be pillar number one. Pillar number two would be um, phasing out fossil fuels. This would be the managed decline. I know Cara hates that term, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, we, you know, which combinations of you know, levels of emissions, degrees of responsibility, capacity to meet um, these, these different goals, that would have to be agreed in terms of a broad pillar to phase out. And the third part would be the, the global just transition, which would have a, a series of procedural distributional elements. So those are the sort of commitments, the three key pillars on implementation. Obviously, as we've just heard, the information we have available is often private, it's dispersed, it's incomplete, it's scattered. The registry is a fantastic start in moving this, this forward. Um, we do need uh, a more complete reporting and, and review mechanism, far more transparency, um, so that you can meaningfully track where, where there are gaps in progress. And you'd want mechanisms, as you have with many treaties, uh, whereby civil society and organisations and others could hold governments to account when they fail to deliver on promised commitments. Um, and so in terms of compliance and effectiveness, there's obviously various measures that could be um, imagined. It might be around facilitative measures, capacity building, that type of thing. Um, at the harder end of the spectrum, you could imagine um, exclusions from access to particular markets. If you think about the exclusive arrangements under the Montreal Protocol, things like that might be, might be useful. Clearly with uh, carbon uh, market adjustment mechanisms in the EU and elsewhere, some countries, some regions are thinking about tougher ways of excluding products from markets. That would be, that's somewhat harder to imagine in the, in the first instance, but over time, there may be growing support for that to ensure that no countries are free riding <clears throat> on their commitments under such a treaty. Uh, in terms of financial mechanisms, one thing Andrew and I proposed in the paper, we wrote about this a few years back, was a global transition fund to support countries uh, through a just transition process and to, to, to diversify their economies. That could be funded by carbon taxes or the redirection of, um, the thing, I think it's still 11 um, million US dollars a minute, is it, that go on, that are spent on, around the world on fossil fuel subsidies. There's people in this room that know more about that than me. But we might also think about proposals for climate easements or debt for climate swaps, going back to the importance of, of debt that Zipporah spoke to earlier. Uh, so finally, just one other thing, because it's obviously crucial given that, you know, as Zipporah was saying in her talk the other day, we're seeing this driven by a lot of bottom-up momentum, you know, cities taking the lead, um, communities, um, businesses, non-governmental organisations. So we clearly, a bit like under the climate regime, you need scope to capture, to document, to record the many different things that people are doing to try and limit production of fossil fuels. That needs to be a key part of the momentum. You would want a formal platform and a way of recognizing those contributions towards this momentum to keep fossil fuels in the ground. So overall, and just to sum up, I guess for me, the, the major appeal of, of a treaty um, is that this transition has to happen, and it can happen in a really disorderly, chaotic, conflict-ridden way, which is the way we seem to be moving at the moment, or it can happen in a way which is subject to international law and governed through multilateral institutions in which countries that need to undergo a just transition in particular have, a fair, have more of a say and greater scope for participation. And my preference, obviously, is for the latter. And I think the treaty is one important. It's certainly not the only way, but it's one important way uh, for moving that forward. And I'll stop there. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.
Whew. And he did all that in eight and a half minutes. Let's take a breath. That was a lot of information. <laughs> that was exciting. Um, uh, our next speaker is uh, Rebecca Burns. Uh, Rebecca is the deputy director of the Treaty Initiative and, and also uh, leads on the initiative's research strategy and was the project director of the Global Registry of Fossil Fuels. She previously worked with the Grantham Research Institute on energy and just transition policy, as well as the New South Wales government. And since 2015 has been advising um, the least developed country group within the climate negotiations. And is also currently undertaking a PhD at Australian National University. And I can tell you from working with her daily, I'm pretty sure she doesn't sleep. So um, Rebecca's going to be talking about the legal pathways to getting a treaty um, and looking at uh, a, a number of different uh, of other treaties and, and what the potential pathways to achieving a fossil fuel treaty. Rebecca, over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Sephora. Uh, so I think this follows on really well from what Peter just outlined. I'm going to take a step back and look at how we get to a treaty in the first place, uh, looking at lessons from historic regimes, primarily humanitarian um, in treaty instruments. And obviously, if you were here yesterday, you would have heard Sephora talk about the amazing momentum that the fossil fuel treaty campaign has generated so far. And so the subject of my talk is really how we move from that campaign into a formal multilateral process. So I'll be presenting on some of the work um, by my colleagues. So I have to say this is very much the work of a couple of colleagues of ours, Christy McLeod and Kate Rafferty, who have done the original analysis. And we have a paper by Christy McLeod that's just been published on the Fossil Fuel Treaty website, if you're interested in learning more. Here are some goals of the Fossil Fuel Treaty. I won't go into that because I think we've probably, you've, you've heard a lot about that now, but obviously very happy to talk about that during the questions. But here are the uh, treaty instruments that we analysed in our research. So it, for this particular piece of analysis, we primarily focused on humanitarian regimes. There are four here. Uh, the two that I'm going to focus on mostly are the landmine ban treaty and the uh, nuclear ban treaty, because they're the newest uh, examples of successful treaty campaigns. I've also included the global plastics treaty campaign here, because it's an example of how we see uh, the lessons learned from the humanitarian movement also applying quite nicely in the environmental space. And so basically what I'm going to cover is a set of what I'm calling six key ingredients for treaty making. And I would say that these, none of these are particularly surprising. In fact, they might be quite obvious. But I think what's really, I guess, encouraging or useful is to note that through the, um, the regimes that we've looked at, these ingredients really played a role in all of them. So it's quite a clear recipe for how you move from building a campaign to getting an actual treaty instrument at the end. To start with, I'm going to uh, tell you a story about the movement to end, uh, to ban nuclear weapons. So in 2006, a group of activist doctors based in Melbourne, Australia, launched a new global campaign calling for a ban on nuclear weapons. So previously we had the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, but nuclear weapons weren't banned. Now they started out quite small. They had a single staff person in a small office in Carlton in Melbourne um, and a group of NGO partners primarily based in Australia. And they were coalescing around uh, quite a simple idea. Firstly, that nuclear weapons need to be banned, but also that there is a power in harnessing uh, non-nuclear armed states to, to apply pressure to nuclear armed states to make that happen. So over time, they started to try and build that, uh, their network. And within a year, they had members from all around the world. They had presented a report on the need for a nuclear ban to the UN. Within two years, the Dalai Lama and the UN Secretary General had declared their support for ICANN, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons and for a nuclear ban. Within three years, they had funding from the government of Norway to set up an office in Oslo and then in Geneva. And then they basically continued to build this drumbeat. So they secured the support of the Red Cross, the World Trade Union Movement, the World Council of Churches, Pope Francis, 800 parliamentarians, and they led global coordinated advocacy efforts like Global Days of Action as well on a regular basis. And then simultaneous to that, there was an ongoing diplomatic process. So in 2014, there were two conferences on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons um, in Mexico and Austria. And at the end of those, there was a pledge by 127 countries calling for the elimination and prohibition of nuclear weapons. Two years later, there was a resolution in the UN General Assembly um, 
uh, where countries, a majority of countries voted to ban nuclear weapons. And within a year, less than a year after that, there was a treaty that had been negotiated and adopted by countries. So I think this example shows, really shows the, um, I guess it epitomizes the ingredients that I'm going to work through. Obviously, um, I will say that as an initiative, we're really keen to learn from those that have experience in these spaces as well. So, um, you know, really keen to learn from others who have experience working within multilateral regimes so we can keep building on this knowledge. The first ingredient that we've identified is probably quite obvious, but I think really the foundation, which is building a movement. So what we've seen is that all of the campaigns that have then led to successful treaties have firstly focused on shifting the narrative. So for landmines and nuclear, the idea was that they shifted the narrative away from vilifying country governments to stigmatizing the weapons themselves, um, with the idea being that that enabled countries to then actually become legitimate actors in the process and, and participate in the treaty making process. And they also focused on really engaging and enrolling um, groups of champions. So we've got here celebrities, scientists, um, you know, we had people like the Dalai Lama and the Pope as moral leaders, former heads of state is a real key part. And, and cities and subnational governments actually is a really integral part of, of many of these campaigns. The second ingredient is building the evidence base. So this has included um, establishing formal institutions like the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, carrying out investigations like investigations by the Red Cross um, and the Human Rights Watch on the impacts of landmines and also creating mandates within the UN process on transparency as well. So uh, there was a UN General Assembly resolution calling for a report on the problems um, associated with landmines, for example. And then building on this uh, is starting to bring in country governments as, as champions or first movers. So there are several ways this has happened. One is regionally with land, um, landmine free zones and nuclear free zones. And one is by getting several country governments to start to pioneer and champion the idea and then um, essentially use their diplomatic power to engage other governments. So with the landmines ban example, um, Canada and Austria were really uh, key in hosting conferences and starting to push the concept with, with other countries. And then building on that is a series of conferences and convenings. So starting to formalize the process a little bit more. Um, these often started as NGO led conferences. Uh, with Landmine Ban, there was a, a conference of 70 participants um, in 1993, which grew to 450 participants from both NGOs and governments two years later, which then led to governments starting to take the helm and a formal process of um, government led conferences. Um, there were two in Ottawa in Canada, uh, the one which initiated um, negotiations and one which concluded them. And this really happened in quite a short space of time, but was in sort of an incremental process um, that became more and more formalized. A really key step, and this sort of, this has to happen relatively early in the process, but has to be led by um, governments, is deciding on the forum where negotiations will take place. So interestingly, all of the instruments that we looked at, there's quite a, a range of forums. Um, the nuclear ban treaty was negotiated within the UN General Assembly because they were able to get a majority vote there. Um, the chemical weapons and the original nuclear non-proliferation treaty happened in an autonomous body called what's now called the Conference on Disarmament. It's changed over time, but it has a, a different set of rules and does report into the UN, but also operates outside of it. Interestingly, the landmine ban treaty wasn't able to get a resolution within the UN General Assembly. Um, so instead, Canada convened a conference in Ottawa uh, where it, countries just decided to take forward negotiations outside of the formal UN process, which is a completely valid option. And so that um, treaty was negotiated by a group of countries um, that was concluded the following year. It now reports to the UN Secretary General, but it, it created its own standalone process. And the Plastics Treaty, which doesn't exist yet, it's in the process of negotiations right now, is happening through the uh, relatively new uh, UN Environment Assembly, which meets every two years. And so the choice of forum has a lot of impact in terms of how quick the negotiations can take place and what the rules are. And one thing that experts have been advising the Fossil Fuel Treaty Initiative is that uh, there are a couple of key things. One is the ability of civil society to participate. And with the landmine ban standalone process, that was really um, a key part of that being successful was that civil society was very actively engaged. And the other is that um, uh, uh, it, ideally finding a process that is not consensus based. So the UNFCCC is a consensus based decision making body, which means there's a lowest common denominator approach and it's quite hard to have binding ambitious 
um, commitments. Whereas, say, the UN General Assembly is majority-based decision-making, and it does enable some countries, like with a nuclear ban, um, the non-nuclear armed states were able to push through a, a treaty, despite the fact that uh, nuclear armed states weren't initially uh, and aren't yet involved. And the very final point is probably also very obvious, but very important, is how you define the substance of the treaty. And Peter has obviously talked about a lot of what that substance could be. One thing that we've also been advised by experts is that it's really important for civil society not to draft a treaty. The treaty needs to be generated by governments to enable buy-in to the process. But civil society has a really important role to play in crafting the principles that underpin the treaty. So we've seen some academic work start to develop. I know this is too small to read, but I think it's a really good example if you look on the website of either the Centre for International Environmental Law or the Environmental Investigation Agency, this is a table they put together of the core elements and principles that should underpin the plastics treaty. And it's been a really core, useful, very simple tool that's then fed into what the resolution um, that eventually was successful in the UN Environment Assembly looked like to start the negotiations of the treaty. So they set a baseline for what the treaty should look like without, um, without necessarily doing the job of countries who need to be involved in that process. We're running out of time. I will just very quickly conclude by saying, I won't go through the lessons learned. Um, what I'll just say is two, two very quick challenges that I think have come through the process and that are often raised. Uh, one is that um, treaty taking, making does take time and that's a valid, um, a valid criticism. One thing I'll say is that, uh, just to say what's on this slide is that from the point of a first country expressing support to the conclusion of a treaty, um, in the landmine ban treaty and nuclear, that took three years. So while the campaign process might take some time, once a country engages, it can actually happen quite quickly. Obviously, fossil fuels are a bit of a different beast, but there is some optimism there to note that this, this can happen relatively quickly. And finally, um, there's a criticism that, well, if we're not going to get producer states involved, is there a point in having a treaty? And we've seen that with the nuclear ban. This is a long paragraph here, but basically the crux of it is just there's a huge normative power in treaty making. And even if, say, fossil fuel producers aren't involved, similar with the nuclear ban where the nuclear armed states aren't involved, there's a huge normative and narrative element which enables the countries that have crafted this ambitious, in the case of nuclear, an ambitious ban treaty to put diplomatic pressure onto nuclear armed states. And I think a similar um, approach can apply in the case of fossil fuels as well. So I'll conclude there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. Our final speaker today is Dr. Katherine Harrison. She's a professor of political science at the University of British Columbia. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees in chemical engineering before completing her PhD in political science. Uh, before entering academia, Catherine worked as a policy analyst for both Environment Canada and the United States Congress. She's going to speak, be speaking to us about the political economy of fossil fuel supply. Thank you. Can you folks hear me okay with my mask still on? All right, I'm gonna keep it then. Um, I'm presenting work that is co-authored with Amy Janswood, my colleague at UBC now, soon to be at McGill. And Amy has very much taken the lead in this project, and I'm going to do my best to channel her in this presentation. <laughs> the problem that's going to be very obvious to everyone in this room, we need to make dramatic reductions in our production of all fossil fuels um, year after year. Um, and we also need to leave most of the known reserves in the ground. But also, as we know, the focus has been on um, consumption of fossil fuels rather than production. And as we've already seen, much less attention to the production side in UN documents. So our research question is what are the patterns in who is talking about fossil fuel production in the NDCs? And we're very much building on, or trying to build on, extend the fantastic work that's been done by Georgia Piggott, um, uh, all the folks at SEI, and including Natalie, who's already presented on their most recent reports. <clears throat> One of the questions that we get asked is, well, they're not required to talk about production in their NDC, so why would any country do it? And we identify three different um, broad hypotheses or groups of hypotheses in the literature. The first is 
One reason to do it is for fairness or equity reasons. And although, you know, some of us who study international politics might say, well, yeah, sure. This is what they've signed on to. <laughs> CBDR is fundamental to the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement. So in theory, these countries have committed to that. And here we would expect that the wealthier countries would be the ones that would disproportionately be showing leadership in um, planning to reduce or planning for decline of fossil fuel production. A second set of hypotheses follows from the um, economic modeling that has been done, anticipating where would production come from under different climate action and economic scenarios. And there we identify two main hypotheses. Um, the idea being that countries that are either uh, producing costly to produce, have high costs of production or have carbon intensive production are especially vulnerable when global demand for fossil fuels decline, the price of fossil fuels go down, and that will disproportionately price the high carbon producers or carbon intensive producers whose costs will go up out of the market. So these are the ones that should be anticipating problems and we might expect to be um, disproportionately um, taking action or at least talking about it. That said, there's a counter argument that at least in the short term, anticipating decline in um, long-term decline in markets might prompt quite the opposite, that these countries might try to get as much of their high cost and dirty oil to market as fast as they can while they still can. So the, the green paradox. And finally, we look at comparative political economy literature, um, looking at the domestic politics within different countries. And I'm not going to talk about all of it in the short time, but um, the key comparison we make there is between net exporters and net importers. The idea being that if a country is producing primarily for its own consumption, then they at least in transitioning to clean energy can offset the loss of jobs in production with domestic jobs. On the other hand, countries that are net, net exporters that are producing on a much larger scale are both more financially dependent, the governments tend to be more financially dependent on the revenues, but also transitioning domestic demand from fossil fuels to clean energy is not going to create anywhere near as many jobs as might be lost in phasing down very large scale production. Um, so what we do is we only look at NDCs of fossil fuel producing countries identified from um, the BP database. We're now up to about 65 because we've coded the French and Spanish ones as well as the English ones. Um, the, um, we've coded the NDCs. I think I might have missed a slide. Did I? Yeah, I did. We've coded them for a number of different things related to production, any explicit reference to production, increase, maintaining, winding down of any fossil fuel, any equity arguments they make either to reduce or not to reduce their production. Um, we looked at what they're saying about extraction related emissions and finally, um, what discussion they have about economic transition, just transition, diversification of their economies. Um, and then we combine that coding from NDCs with additional data sources as a proxy for income. We look at the Human Development Index from the UN. Um, in the case of cost of production and carbon intensity of production, we could only find um, national level data on oil. So we only look at oil there where the cost of production per barrel and carbon intensity per barrel is drawn from Masnati et al. 2021, updating an earlier publication. And then imports, exports, domestic consumption we get from IEA data. What um, do we find? First of all, very limited evidence that higher income producers are more willing than lower income producers to anticipate decline or limit their production. Only one higher income producer, Oman, talks about shift, uh, reducing its GDP 
um, reliance on um, fossil fuels. And in that case, a bit of digging suggests that they anticipate a decline in their um, resource rather than an intentional one. What we do see is that higher income countries were less likely to plan for increasing their production. So a quarter of them talk about increasing production versus half of the lower income ones. So that's kind of consistent, but wow, it's such a drop in the bucket compared to where we need to be. Lots of talk about fairness, but the fairness arguments that are made are a rationale not to reduce production because of economic dependence on fossil fuel production rather than um, a rationale that uh, as the countries that are contributing to this problem and have profited from it, there is a special responsibility. Economic incentives, we find little evidence that higher cost producers are more likely to be planning for decline than lower cost producers. Again, only one of the high cost producers, Oman, is talking about shifting its economic reliance away from oil. Um, rather, we see consistent with the green paradox, paradox that both low and high cost producers are um, planning on production increases in large numbers. Carbon intensity of production, again, limited evidence. Many carbon intensive producers are talking about um, expanding their production, some examples there, or continuing. Um, what we do see is, as with income, the income comparison, a less likelihood that carbon intensive producers are planning to increase their production. And I'm wondering there, rather than a government effect, we are seeing um, an investment effect where um, the private um, private markets may not be investing in some of these capital intensive long-term projects. And we're seeing a differentiation between the capitalized versus new production there. Um, rather than planning for decline, carbon intensive producers tend to be planning to reduce the emissions intensity of their production. Now, that's consistent with the demand side only approach, but especially in the case of exporters, what they're doing is, is um, protecting the competitiveness of their oil exports. Um, a number of strategies, uh, domestic reductions through carbon tax, reducing flaring, carbon capture, um, but also lowering the mitigation costs by creating flexibility through domestic offsets and reliance on voluntary international mechanisms and increasingly relying on uh, governments. This is not so much discussed in the NDC, although Canada was candid, that they are subsidizing the um, emissions reductions because Canada considers that an efficient fossil fuel subsidy um, and thus trying to keep very carbon intensive oil competitive as long as possible. We see somewhat more support for the um, domestic political economy hypothesis that net exporters um, are um, less likely than the net importers to be anticipating and planning for decline. Um, only Oman in the case of oil again. Canada talks about um, phasing out coal, ex uh, coal production that is both very selective um, across fossil fuels and within coal, because Canada mostly exports um, metallurgical coal and is, is talking about phasing out the um, thermal coal, and also because coal isn't nearly as important as oil and gas um, uh, for Canada's economy. In contrast, we do see several net importers, especially in the case of coal, talking about production decline, mostly in conjunction with um, phasing out um, coal-fired electricity. So to summarize, um, very limited evidence of voluntary um, planning for reductions consistent with the CBDR principle. Um, higher cost and carbon intensity oil producers are, there's no evidence that they are planning for decline, quite the opposite. Many of them are trying to get as much oil to market as they can. Somewhat stronger support for um, the domestic political economy, but very selective, more attention to coal, lots of enthusiasm for getting as much gas on the market as possible as a transition fuel. Um, lots of Fossil fuel producers, particularly the wealthier countries, 
are talking the talk. There's more frequent references to economic diversification and just transition, but they're not yet walking the walk. Um, in fact, overall, we see a, a remarkable level of denial, even among the countries that either have the greatest historical responsibility or are most economically vulnerable, that action on climate change is threatening um, their production and their economies, which is all the more reason that we need collaboration on both reporting and um, gradually wind down through um, BOGA and the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine. It is, um, so in, 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 in some total, um, I would say the conversation on international cooperation to constrain supply in, in, in a way that aligns with Paris goals is both incredibly sobering and incredibly exciting. <laughs> that's, that's the thing with these countries basically doing nothing yet to constrain production is that there are so many ways that and new ideas of where we could possibly go. The floor is open now to all of you to ask questions to any of our panelists. I'm going to take these first three and then, um, and then we'll see how much time we have. Thank you. Um, so my question is for Johnny. And um, so I'm, I guess I'm trying to understand a bit better what the um, fossil fuel registry can do compared to, um, let's say, like the Reistad data. So, I mean, I've been using the, the GEM data for um, gas power generation because that's not necessarily available in, in Reistad or at least not in the U-Cube. And then there's an emissions queue. So I've been painstakingly sort of converting volumes in terms of uh, gigaton emissions. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm I want to use your, your public registry, and I think like we sh the the academia should rally on the on the public registry, and that, that would be great if the the the, um, the data would be available for all. Um, but I'm wondering, like uh, first of all, if there's kind of um, a webinar that explains the uh, the functionality like in detail, and uh, what would we be sort of losing compared to the Reistat data in terms of user functionality, in terms of making graphs, and so uh, we have a Reistat subscription, for example, and then I'm wondering um, what would be sort of the, the transition cost uh, in terms of changing and um, and yeah, basically. Uh, like, I think we'll just um, take that one. It's very specific, uh, sure. Johnny. So why don't you answer that, and then we'll go to the next two. Um, yes, um, thanks for the question. Um, well, you mentioned access, the fact that this is open. That's obviously very key in terms of uh, um, all categories of users. I mean, I don't know your particular situation, but uh, we've been talking yesterday about building uh, coalitions and building power and uh, civil society. So there are many situations in which that's the difference between, you know, something happening and nothing happening if that or, or information going into a process or not. Um, but beyond that question of of um, access, um, I, I, I have used Reistad quite extensively in the past, and actually I still kind of dip in on their webinars from time to time. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but Reistad is put together by extremely smart people um, and presents you with very shiny sheets of numbers. You have zero provenance on any of those numbers, right? When you have a, a field in Siberia, um, it gives you a series of numbers which tells you that that's the historic production and then a series of future projections. In some cases, and I actually know this because there have been cases where I've phoned them up, and the same with, with Mackenzie. Um, um, I phoned them up and said, okay, what's the basis for the future thing? And could it be like this or could it be like that? And the next time you look at it, the numbers have changed and it looks like they've changed as a result of your conversation. Mm -hmm. So well, I, don't, I don't mean to um, do down those services. They're very, very good. And they're, you know, they're very smart people working very conscientiously, but there's no provenance. Sometimes that number is uh, a genuine piece of data direct from a uh, trusted party. Sometimes it's like, pretty much everyone who does modeling does is interpolation. You know, there's a 2025 number and a 2030 number and they interpolate, but you will never know, right? <laughs> because because you, you take it, and so far it's shown that it's good enough for those. 
purposes. But if you take that then beyond this current question, and I should also say, of course, that the registry, when you say, well, what can you do in terms of fancy direct um, creation of graphs and so on, the data is downloadable. So the question of making a graph out of it is, you know, not instant, but, you know, one or two minutes. However, the data is very, very gappy, as I mentioned. Um, so there would be large areas where Reistat has numbers in the registry currently doesn't have any numbers. So then, you know, carry on with your subscription. But in the end, sorry, it's too long. Um, in the end, we cannot expect um, the kinds of treaties between sovereign states uh, to happen without a trusted basis of information. And um, I, I'm going to guess that there's never been a precedent. You know, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty didn't didn't, you know, it wasn't that all signatory states happened to have a subscription to some commercial information service. So it goes beyond the question of immediate utility. In the end, mm. we, will, we will, will need that as a trusted uh, basis. Uh, and those Reistad numbers on emissions and Wood-Mac numbers on emissions are mysteriously lower than IEA numbers or uh, RMI numbers, which are public agencies. And we can discuss how much of a coincidence that is. So there's also the question of incumbency and self-interest. Thanks, Johnny. Um, uh, so there, um, there are going to be, I know, um, some webinars on how to use the registry and understanding the registry, et cetera. Um, and so uh, if you don't see Johnny or Rebecca afterwards to make sure you get on those lists if you're interested in doing those more detailed webinars. I had two questions here. One that was up there and one that was right there. Uh, thank you, Shin Nasayama from National Institute of Environmental Studies, Japan. So I have a question to Rebecca. I want to ask about the legal nature of non-proliferation treaties. So I'm not a legal expert, so correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it is often said like the you know, success of the Paris Agreement is based on uh, on a weak agreement. It's not like strictly speaking, like you know, legally, like a treaty. It requires like an you know, parliamentary approval. Uh, this is important, particularly important for the U.S. because U.S. never signed the treaty to need to require the Senate approval, and so it was only like you know, signed by the president. That's why the U.S. joined the Paris Agreement. And um, so I'm just wondering about, so to be successful, the treaty to be successful, do we need to, like, you know, the treaty needs to also striving for a more weak agreement, sort of like, you know, similar to the Paris Agreement, or, or we should require to be more stronger commitment and to legally binding, sort of like requiring like, the parliamentary like, approval, or what, what's your take on that? Thank you. I'm gonna also take the question that was right down here because we're butting up against lunch, so let's get those last two out, and I'm sorry, right. we're running out of time. Thanks, and I think this will be a good segue. I'm Kathy Mulvey. I'm with the Union of Concerned Scientists, um, but in my previous role with, with corporate accountability, I was very involved in civil society mobilization around the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. So I guess this is mainly for Peter and Rebecca, um, but one of the provisions of that treaty obligates parties to protect their public health policy policies from commercial and other vested interests of the tobacco industry. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering, you know, it, it seems really important to, to be thinking about that both in terms of substance, but also the process itself. And um, wondering your thoughts on that. Thank you. Peter, Rebecca, Rebecca, do you want to start with the registry question? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's a, it's a really fair point. Um, it's really a trade-off. So I think there are two options at the extremes. One is a treaty that has less binding commitments, you know, like the Paris Agreement. Ultimately, it's not binding. Countries are able to submit their own NDCs, as we've heard. And therefore, it's more universal. Almost all countries are signatories to the Paris Agreement. The other extreme is a country that has ambitious binding um, commitments, but fewer countries will be members. With the fossil fuel treaty, because it's really designed as a complement to Paris, so we see Paris as being the baseline. It sets the 1.5 degree temperature goal. Um, countries are submitting NDCs. We don't really want to replicate another Paris. So the idea is to go towards the other end of the, the spectrum and have stronger binding commitments. We don't expect that, say, my country, Australia, or the US, or Russia will become members of this treaty, at least initially. And 
we that's in some ways by design because if they were it would mean that the commitments were likely not strong enough and not in line with 1.5 degrees and not in line with the just transition so the idea is really to create a set of binding ambitious commitments that create a normative um, shift and create a baseline that then countries that are members of the treaty can create diplomatic pressure but it also creates a tool for advocates within major producer countries to then start to hold them to account um, it's not a silver bullet but it's a it's a tool as part of the broader kind of regime of, of things, you know, alongside the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, alongside NDCs and um, the Paris Agreement that we've heard about today. Um, and maybe I'll Thanks. head over to Peter on the yeah. Sure, just quickly on the yeah, the tobacco example and precedent. I mean, I think what it points to is that there's sort of clear conflicts of interest, right? And that, and that is a, a huge challenge and it operates at every level. We see it internationally in terms of who sits on the delegation and as we saw at Glasgow, you know, fossil fuel companies were a delegation would be the largest one there. And, you know, at national level, it's around revolving doors, party donations, who sits on the committees. I mean, there's huge work to do in terms of undoing incumbency, <laughs> like rolling back. It's, it's hard to sort of say definitively who has a legitimate right to be in the room to discuss these things. Of course, companies on one level have, have some sort of right to be there. I guess sometimes I think like with, you know, like Saudi delegation or others, when it's mainly made up of members of Saudi Aramco, there's questions about, are you at all interested in the overall objective of this purpose? And, and, and maybe there are, and I know Salim Haq and others have talked about this, we do need stronger conflict of interest policy at the international level. But certainly I think the battle for activists at national level is further expose work about about what's going on and i say that as someone in the uk who has a new prime minister rolling back on fracking who used to work for shell for example <laughs> thank you peter um and i want to thank you all for your tremendous uh research um it, it said when you look at treaties and new issues like this um, that are intransigent problems that haven't been addressed in existing structures and that require international cooperation, that the journey really matters. And, and I was struck here listening to all of you, you know, being in this room and having this conversation now for a number of years, six years or something, uh, again, how far we've come because, and how critical it is, your research, Natalie and Catherine, that we are showing the world that no, we're not doing it yet through the Paris Agreement. Um, that's really important because in fact, when we first started proposing the treaty, that was the response that we got, <laughs> wasn't it, in the UK Parliament? And Boris has said, but the Paris Agreement does that, constrains production and says who gets to produce what. And we're like, no, no, it doesn't actually. <laughs> and, but it, it, the number of countries that we've met with that mm. actually have no idea that there isn't rules on who gets to produce what is totally fascinating. And mm. this research is pretty critical to really show that. The data and transparency so countries can see for themselves. I sat with a vulnerable nation in New York last week and played with the registry database. And that was the point where they got excited about the treaty, actually, because nice. they, they were like, Norway's going to what? Canada's doing, this is not okay. Yeah, and yeah. and to be, ha, give that to countries so they can see for themselves. And then, you know, trying to look at and develop what are the ways that we're going to coordinate, that we're going to govern this new space. Um, what are some of the ideas and, and creative ways that we can ensure that fairness and equity are at the basis of all of these new conversations on how to constrain supply? I think tremendous research that you've all been doing. I'm sorry we didn't have more time for questions. I promised we'd finish in time for you all to get to lunch. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.